version. So uh, one of the things I think I always like to start off with is kind of go real quickly. You know, we're going to look at some time management, but I don't want this to be applied. I think anything that you do, you know, a lot of times we teachers call them theoretical models and big, big picture stuff, right? But it's got to be practical. So I want you to think about your routine. So while we're going through the session, think about your routine, think about your goals, think about the things that really matter the most to you. And uh, as you go through and learn some of these tips, so you can stick to them. Look at time management and make sure time management. I got some different tools and techniques. I've actually studied this uh, stuff from a variety of angles. There was the stuff I learned in college of, you know, how to do time management from like just like, here's the theory and here's some tips and tricks. And then there was like, I tested it. And then I learned some different approaches. And I went to California and I did some of these really cool IT conferences and I heard programmers talk about how they manage projects and how project management to build out, roll out apps like Facebook and Twitter, uh, how, they, how they manage time. So I listened to all these different approaches. And then I kind of pulled it together in, in a little bit of a, a kind of a combined approach. Every, everybody has their own system. Some of you guys, how many people use your phones to manage your calendar? Is anybody really big on calendars on your phones? How many people have a printed uh, old school? Jim, I know you and I probably have the old school, you know, paper, uh, makes notes. I like that too. So I have two. Uh, which was Stephen Covey's seminar years ago. I mean, the company I work for, I've worked for several Fortune 500 companies. I started about uh, eight years, six businesses, one on seven now, almost eight of you got some, uh, some little, little consulting gigs. But, you know, each one of those expensive sessions and seminars say, you got to figure out your own. And even though Stephen Covey, he talks about, well, you need to have this system because it's a Covey time management system. But you can also use those. So I want to look at kind of those benefits. And then the, the bottom line is, what are the benefits of really managing your time? Uh, again, I've been blessed to have a great job as a teacher, but also do consulting work. And I'm starting a small business in our community. And I also do a lot of consulting work. And I have a 40-acre farm, and I travel internationally several times a year. And I keep all these little tasks in little buckets, and I juggle these buckets to do the things I really value. And so, uh, you know, we got to figure out this, what I always say, what is your goals? You know, and so I want you guys to think, if you have a notepad, or if you have a piece of paper, or you should think about it in your mind, is what are some of the big goals that's stopping you right now? And somebody go around, tell me, a, tell me a big goal that you have that you just you can't reach. Somebody share it with me. You know, mine, if you have some ideas, Throw it in the chat box. I think we're monitoring that. So somebody toss out some a big goal that you just can't reach, or you're trying so hard to reach it, and you're just you need some help. Getting paid the big bucks. Huh? <laughs> so getting paid the big bucks. That's an enormous goal. There's a ginormous <laughs> goal out here that we'll call those the big, that hairy audacious goal. <laughs> trying to keep the business going. All right, maintaining the small business. Good. Starting a small business. Great. We got a young professional starting a small business. Juggling uh, 10,000 things. Uh, I was gonna say consistency. Okay, being consistent. How you know how to keep that energy going because we have a lot of things pulling us to the side. Uh, and that's that's really a, a challenging thing because we're bombarded with media, right? I think our marketing friends who do marketing and social media say, you know, we got to target the customer 3,000 times a day, well, 300 times a day, uh, to really capture their attention to buy our product. So we're you know, there's a billion dollar in probably more than that. A trillion dollar industry out there all over the world targeting all of us at one time to get our attention, right? Because that attention is a commodity. To me, I said this years ago, I said that, you know, if you really want to know what a successful business looks like, it's the ones that manage their time effectively and they keep their focus. To me, attention and focus is the most important skill to have in today's business. So when I have students say, well, do I need to learn leadership skills? Do I need to learn relationship skills? Do I learn, need to learn marketing and finance? I said, no, learn to focus your energy on the things that matter. Um, I think that's a commodity to me. And I think Jack Welch said it too, that the secret of today's businesses is not the products, the technology, the processes of customers, it's the people. It's the people in the business who contribute their time and energy to get things done. And I always like this, you know, we've got 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day, and 168 hours a week. How many hours do you watch TV? Somebody throw me out. How many people like to watch TV? Netflix, like a Prime, a day, YouTube. How many hours? In a day, in yeah. a week, in a day, probably a day. Like two. Okay, two, 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 three, four hours a day. I know people watch TV more than that. 
So this, you think about it, there's five hours. Okay, then how much time we spend eating? We get, I mean, the whole day. At least four hours of eating. Right? Yeah, you know, you're, 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 you know, athlete. And so four hours. Jim, he and I probably, back in the day, we probably knock out eating about five, six hours. No. So we got six, seven hours we're watching TV and eating. Now, where's the, and then we got work. How much of that really, that eight hour work day, do we work eight hours? I can't remember the last time I truly worked an eight hour day. True, my boss is not. <laughs> How many of us truly work an eight hour day? I try. Doing important things. Right? Now, is answering an email important? Is answering a phone call important? Is interfacing with a customer important? Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot of those little things that we kind of say, those are important tasks in my day. So uh, we're going to look at those tasks in a little bit more finite detail. But I want to think about what are some of the benefits. If I can manage my time well in my small business, or I'm starting a business, or as a student, or if I'm juggling kids and a family, what are some of the benefits of good time management? Why do we want this? Why are y'all here today? If you can manage your time well, what do you get? Okay, you get that feeling more productive. Less stress. Yes, yeah, stress. How many people have stress in their life? Families, kids, responsibilities, bills, coaches, teachers, etc. So we have stress. And stress is that thing that's always following us. To me, you know, one of the things I always said when I was in the corporate world working 60, 70 hours a week is this sure is stressful and it sure is not good for my health. And I've got to get out of it. And uh, I've worked seven or eight years in this one company and transitioned back into a different lifestyle. And after I look back, I'm like, why did I put myself in a stressful situation? Because I didn't, I made a lot of money, but was I really happy? So I want us to think about, to me, good time management is about managing stress. I am in a stress-free world these days. I mean, I have stress, but it's a good stress. I mean, it's the motivational stress that you know you're going to have to do something but it's not causing you pain and anxiety and health problems. Because if we can't function with our health, we can't function be productive. If I'm worried about my weight or my health or my heart or my family's health, I'm not going to be as a productive person. So we've got to grasp hold of this whole time management topic. So let's kind of hit um, uh, the first step, which is the goal setting piece. Like go back to what's important to you right now. Starting your business, managing your business, juggling things and keeping on focus. Uh, it all starts with what I consider these, this little tip I learned. Probably the first thing about setting goals is this SMART goal setting. I'm sure all of you have heard the term SMART goals. Um, specific. How clearly to define goals? Well, managing your business to keep it open. That's pretty specific in, in our mind, but it's not really specific enough. Give me another specific goal. If you're running a business and you're think I got to keep it going and sustaining. What's a more specific goal? Yeah. For example, to gain new, two new customers in the next two weeks. Okay. And gain. You know, like a specific time and specific um, number of customers. Okay, great. So one specific goal, maybe I'm going to capture and gain two new customers within the next two weeks. Specific, manageable, quantitative metric. What else? specific goal. Now think. You got new customers. New customers, but also um, new items in the store. Or need to get fresh on trend items Good. to the customers. So how what specific products can I bring in to provide to my customers based on what their needs are? So within that, there's probably three or four objectives that you can have. Maybe you would survey your existing customers. Maybe I um, do a little a group. Um, maybe I follow a group on Facebook of, of people who are in the retail industry or in a specific industry, and I reach out to them and get their input. Um, so the specific is really important, and it's got to be measurable. So you know, two new customers, five new products, sixteen pounds. 50 pounds of my bench press, you know, two home runs, whatever that measure that you shoot for, if you don't have a target, you're never going to hit it. And I always like that phrase, you know, you, you know, somebody says, well, where are you going? Well, I don't know. You 
you know, I had three students this week when I asked them, I said, what do you want to do with this degree? I don't know yet. Well, what kind of, well, I want to make money, make a lot of money, right? I want to make a difference in the world. What kind of difference and how much money? And where, if you don't know, it's just like a ship without a captain. You're going to be floating out in the world, and wherever you go is where you are, and that's okay. But if you have a goal that's measurable, it, it's going to be more achievable. And then that's the goal. You know, that's the that's the target. Is achievable. If I set a goal, is this ever like really good? Is you know, for me, I used to make cost a million dollars. Is that what I want? I wanted to do that as a college student. I want to make a million dollars because at the time everybody wanted to make a million dollars. Well, you get pretty close to that, and you're like, gosh, it's no big deal. That wasn't that hard, right? You don't have to really stress and sweat. That's not the new objective. The new objective is a stress-free life that you can travel the world or do whatever else. It's more valuable than that one goal. So we all sometimes think that the achievable goal is sometimes, is it really achievable? And then what I've always learned is sometimes if you set goals really low, you kind of set your mind in that arena. That's okay to set a low achieving goal. You know, one, one business is great. That's all I need to do in my life is start one business. Well, when I was 22, I had two already done. I had a wet consulting business. I don't know in business or landscaping business. I was doing okay. I could probably quit my job or quit my school and done landscaping and computer networking for the rest of my life. This wasn't enough. And so everybody has different levels of achievable goals. The fourth one is uh, rewarding. Is the goal rewarding for you? Is it something that you're really willing to sacrifice? Now, look at this little project we're doing down in the Bluefield, Virginia on this axe throwing business. We're partnering with some students. I'm setting up with another partner with an axe throwing um, goal. It's something I've never done before, but I really like outdoors. And during the COVID, I bought a mill, a sawmill, and I've got all this wood. I've been cutting it up, turning it into slab and lumber. Next thing I know, I've got people offering me thousands of dollars for cables. I'm going to make a few cables. I'm going to make $40 now for a couple of businesses. And I'm like, oh, that's just something I'm doing on the side. This is really fun. Wouldn't it be cool to have a business where you actually get to play with wood and throw axes and stuff and teach other people how cool it is to do outdoors and stuff? And we're doing it. You know, and it's something that I've really saw, seen as a rewarding component. But not only that, it's not just throwing actions and making money and doing something fun at your job, it's actually like, well, the community can really benefit from this because young people have something to do. And what, the first thing I always hear is, there's nothing to do in Bluefield. And Jim and I have had this conversation, it's like, there's a lot to do in Bluefield, you just gotta find it, right? And there are these things out there. So I think, go back to what is rewarding for you? Is it the autonomy of having your own business, which I think a lot of us who start businesses like that, that freedom of starting business, and that's the rewarding part of it business, right? Or do you start seeing things connect? So I think when we're setting goals, how do things connect? And my favorite professor in college, Dr. Dickens, that really kind of pushed me into my career in, in education, said, do more than one thing and make it count for several things. So do do the things, not just one time, but make sure they link together to, and do, you get a lot from one thing, right? She said, if you write a paper and you go present it, try to publish it. Try to get some consulting work from it. And she was right. And I did one thing and I'm like sort of like dabbling it into the other thing, right? So my little hobby in the summer now is turning into a, a, a business. And then the teaching consulting stuff is going to be part of that too. So when I have people who come in that are customers out of the town, I can say, hey, let's go, let's go to Bluefield, West Virginia, and check out some of the restaurants we have over there and some of the projects they got going on over there. So we can be a connector. And that's what makes it important from a rewarding perspective. And is your goal achievable in a time, timely format, in a, in a time frame that you can do it? One of the things, too, <coughs> that I learned, this is a little add-on thing about three or four years ago I learned, about Parkinson's Law. And this is great, because as I've been working with contractors who have that been doing projects at our business, our x-ray business, and, and some of the other things, I'm realizing that when you set a goal timeline for something, we fill it up, and that's Parkinson's Law. So basically it goes like this. The amount of effort expands the time available for completion. So if I said, Jim, I'm giving you, I've got three days to get this grant application out. Jim's going to start looking at it, maybe the first time he learns about it. Might not touch it for about a day and a half. On the last day, he's going to get it done. Because he has experience and knowledge as an expert in those areas. Right? So if I say you've got three days to do something, what do we do? We take the full three days. Could we get it done the first hour? Some things, yeah. So what, what Parkinson's law basically says is we 
fill up the time. And it actually was, I can't remember, I think it was something to do with the guard. It takes back to the 1800s. But work fills to the time available for its completion. So again, instead of just assuming it should take a day and a half or two to three days to frame in like a, a, a space for a, a wall, a couple walls and, and some electrical, we say, can you get this done tomorrow? Set, change the paradigm of how you manage your time. So change that paradigm. We think we can do things in an hour, and it takes four hours sometimes. I don't know how many projects we get in, we get in, we think, oh, it'll just take an hour to paint. That may take four hours. Well, a lot of times it's because we don't have enough experience. And the more you have experience, the more you can manage your time better because you know how much it truly takes. Now, when I look back and I, I promised uh, one of our neighbors here in town 20 tables for his restaurant. And we started this in October, me and a friend and another guy. We just kind of dabbling in and out, making a weekend project, right? Well, we thought we could do six hours on a Friday night, a few hours on a Saturday, maybe an hour or two on Sunday and make a couple of tables. No, it takes about 12 hours to cut the wood, mill the wood, plane the wood, sand the wood, connect the wood, sand the wood more to make one table. So we got to make 20. How do you do that? He's like, wow, I totally underestimated that. I, now that I know, if somebody says, hey, can you build me a, a, a slab table, six foot or a bar top? I would say that's going to take about 20 hours. Before, I might say it take an hour or two because I didn't know. So think about how Parkinson's law affects us and be realistic. It's, it's a double-edged sword. One, if I say, oh, it's going to take me six hours and your customer say, well, I need it in three, you can get it done in three. You just have to manage your time effectively and look at everything else. Uh, another thing is this, this idea of no one has enough time. I always hear this, and I really don't like to hear this from students. Say, well, I still have time to do that. No, it's a sacrifice. I think, you know, you make time for the most important things. I had a manager or a guy who owned several businesses, an entrepreneur, a business leader, say, you have enough time to do what you need to do. He had like 10 businesses, managed to very actively. Employees recognized he was a leader and always making time for them. It didn't always seem rushed. He wouldn't go and say, oh, I gotta go. You know, he, didn't, he wasn't a slave to his calendar. Oh, I gotta go do this. He put it away. He said, I, I'm gonna make time for this. This is important. The relationships are more important than the text, the email, or that message that you can respond to later, right? Uh, so that's something I think is kind of a really valuable aspect. Uh, the work-life balance thing early, a lot of y'all said, you know, if I can manage time better, I can manage stress better. And we want to manage stress. And so I think work-life balance is important. When you prioritize and control your calendar, you get less done, you get more done in less time. And we are looking for those little free bits of, of, of time, don't we? Where we can hang out with a friend, send a snap to a buddy, send an email or text, make a phone call to a parent, a relative. You know, but a lot of times we fill our mind up with so many tasks that we feel we have to get done. And a lot of them are real small things. And, and I'll show you a little example. But we, we don't always do the work-life balance thing real well, right? As a teacher, I'm fortunate because I have summers off. I'm, you know, in another week, I'm literally going to have almost three and a half months off. It's a great opportunity. Isn't it? A lot of people say, gosh, we'll be a teacher. But, you know, during the teaching time, it's a little bit different world, but I look forward to that de stress time so I can recharge my battery. So whether you have a long vacation time or you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a business, make time or slow time, the, the work-life balance. Um, I think it it, uh, it kind of pulls us. Uh, I like to, you know, I learned this from, uh, I don't think we made proof of uh, Anthony Robbins. <laughs> that was kind of a motivational self Felt freak when I was in high school because I didn't have a direction. I wasn't really sure what my goals were. You know, I didn't know if I was going to be working on the farm or making hamburgers and Wendy's. When I, I did that when I was 16. I thought, maybe this is my future. So I didn't have a really good, strong sense of what was meaningful and how to set a purpose driven life, right? I was always reading these self help books. And I found one. It was really good. Anthony Robbins is the, the you see him on uh, these infomercials, but he's really got some good ideas. Awaken the Giant Within is the name of the book. Awaken the Giant Within. That's what really set my uh, mindset in a very positive trajectory. And he talks about keeping your balance. He says you need to focus on balance in these areas. The first area is if you don't have your body and your health, you can't manage the rest of your life. Right? Because your health is contingent on everything. And I really didn't understand that. Exercise, nutrition, and sleep. 
the basic stuff. But we say we're so busy, we got to run by fast food and get some nasty but nasty sandwich to, you know, because that's all I have time for. I usually don't eat out, but maybe once or twice uh, every couple of weeks. But I like to cook. I grew up in high and I, we would spend a lot. I mean, and I've done this for 20 years. I like to cook. I learned to cook. I learned to get away from fast food because I was 280 pounds when I was in the corporate world. I would eat two, two, two times a day out. I was spending at least 60 to $70 a day eating out, and I was gaining an enormous amount of weight. My stress and heart rate and blood pressure was enormous. I was drinking monster energy drinks to keep away because I was doing 12 hour days sometimes, and that wasn't healthy. But I said, you gotta quit that. And so you gotta get on a good pattern. It's so easy as a college student going into a big business world because now you've got all these responsibilities. Right now is a great opportunity to kind of set these good habits. And these are habits. Um, and then sleep. I'll take, I love sleep. I take naps. I was taking naps the other day. Probably student walking on us taking naps. I just you know, got to sleep, right? Because I'm working at 10 o'clock at night on Friday. So, uh, the other area is uh, balance is intellectual. I think it's important to find something that you value, whether it's really crazy music, you like that music or hip hop, or you like country or classical. Find that music or events that you can kind of immerse yourself into. And you do live stuff. I mean, it's great to go to YouTube. You know, just like somebody told me once, well, why do you travel so much? Why do you want to go there? You can go look on YouTube. You can go to Rick Steves and Samantha Clark, Samantha, what her name is, on who does travel vlogs and videos. And you can see all that stuff. My mom does. She's kind of like that. She's like, why do you travel so much? Because there's a difference between when you're there in person and you're watching it on the, on the, on the box. You know, watching it on the box and nothing like being in the real place, right? The memories of, of watching a TV show with my dad versus being somewhere, my memories are rich of hiking Chiquitera in northern Italy, going through the little villages of Ridge More and Granada and grabbing some fresh fish and some amazing drinks and experiencing the culture versus just watching a video on, on YouTube, right? So <clears throat> find those intellectual things and immerse yourself in the cultural aspect and something that's visually aesthetic and also auditory. It's the five senses. The food, the taste, the smell, and other aspects. Because that keeps our minds active. My <clears throat> uncle was eight years old. I saw him last week. Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob is amazing. He hikes at least 20, 30 miles a week. He's got a beautiful cabin up in the mountains of northeast Tennessee. He is just a busy little bee. The one year he'll do plumbing, the next year he's raising bees. He's got an immaculate garden. He is out and he's reading, he's studying, he's involved with all these nature studies and plant studies and vegetable studies, and he's constantly, he says, you know, David, you keep your mind active. He's more, he's more intelligent than I am, and he's 80 years old, and he's a machine, and I respect that, because he is reading something, and he said, I try to do some big new learning thing that stretches my mind every year, and he's been doing that since he was a young child growing up in a very high poverty region in Northeast Tennessee, and so he values that intellectual aspect. We know socially, a lot of students, and a lot of us are stuck in this, having, you know, the social mode, we like to spend time, Socializing. I'm not a big phone talker. If I hear a question call, she wants to talk for about 10 minutes. I'm like, whoa, five minutes, seven minutes, max. No, no more than that. It's a waste of time. I'll catch you and we'll talk in person. I don't want to waste time on the phone. Well, a lot of people do. Like my mom goes on the phone for an hour. I'm like, what are you talking about? Same thing to the same person every couple of days. I'm like, what? But people need that. And I'm different. Maybe, maybe I'm not. Who knows? But I think social is good to make time. I just caught up with the buddy the other day. We talked 45 minutes. And I love their second up. But I can't do that a lot, but it's important to get back to rekindle the relationship. So this is important in work life. I have a friend who is so um, immersed in his job, he doesn't make time for his friends. He always makes excuses, man, I don't have time, he's too busy. Well, he recently got cancer, right? And so he's like, I'm going to quit his job. And I'm like, can we get together? Yeah, but I'm not feeling very well. Well, now he's at that point where now it's too late. You know, he doesn't have the energy to go on a motorcycle ride. Or to do something fun like we take a hike or on a, on a mountain bike trip. So that, that moment with that person is probably not going to happen again because he's so busy in his work and now something's changed. And so I think we've got to value those moments because that helps get recharge up afterwards. Another area of balance in our time management model is keeping your career and keeping that stuff. I think a lot of times we focus in these areas and these things sacrifice. And, and one thing I liked about when I learned this model was you, you've got to be like that little Chinese lady who's spinning plates and she's going back and forth, which is just amazing. You've all seen the video, Google the Chinese plate lady. I mean, she's like spinning plates and she's jumping over here to this one to this one, but she's doing them all, but she's doing it effectively. And when you get in that pattern, you can do them effectively. It's not like you just spin that one plate and you watch the others crash. You know, you're spending time on all of those equally because they're all really 
support to that aspect. So a lot of times we're kind of focused in these two areas of, of our career. Emotional well-being. We know that right now during COVID, we see an enormous amount of people who are going through depression and isolation. Where they don't feel that they're part of a community or they're part of a digital community. And a lot of our online folks have chosen to be online because, you know, that's more comfortable. And I, and I agree. It's, but you've got to find those, the balance between uh, your friends, your family, your special people in your life, your uh, emotional needs, because if we sacrifice what really we value just to make the company happy or the customer happy, sometimes we lose ourselves. And, I, and I've been in some situations, worked with a lot of companies and been a coach to some leaders of big companies. And I see that the relationships at home are out of balance because they're not doing a good job even kind of kicking back into the emotional areas. Or they, they satisfy their emotional needs in an unhealthy way with, you know, lots of relationships that are meaningless and not full, right? A lot of, a lot of, a lot of books out there. And then lastly, spiritual. And I think for us, you know, at Blue Book College, you know, we know our purpose as teachers is to help develop transformational leaders that's going to serve the world. And that's a spiritual, higher level purpose. And a lot of people, I don't care if you believe in God or what other faith you believe in, you need to find something that drives your purpose. And one of the things when I was in Brazil a few years ago, I talked about Ikigai. Here's a great book. Write this word down, Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. Ikigai is the, is the Japanese philosophy of living a meaningful and purposeful life. And so, long story short, I don't know how much time I got, but here, here's a really neat concept. So the Japanese usually live a little longer than anybody else in the world. There's a couple regions in Japan where they live well, a whole community lives well into their 90s and over in the 100s. And they have embraced this concept of ikigai, which is basically a, a life balance of purposeful living that says you need to balance these four areas. Do what you're good at with your talents and strengths. Do what the uh, community needs financially, help you, you know, make money. So you use your strengths, you make money. Um, you do stuff that you love. And then you do stuff that makes a bigger difference in the world. So when you have the intersection of all four of those, and when I work with students now, I'm kind of saying, well, read this book. I use something that's called the Strength Finder. I think I uh, brought my little Strength Finder session. It. It's a little assessment that we do for our students. It's called the Strength Finder. Gallup makes this a statistically significant instrument that companies use to help identify the strengths of their uh, employees. But schools are using them. I have a friend who teaches at an outdoor uh, experiential Waldorf type school. It's a really good education format where those young people learn to, to learn based on their strengths and interests, right? Well, when we do what we're doing well, we're always we're happy. When I know I'm using my strengths, then I'm going to be more successful in my career. If I say, Jim, I need you to be really good at presentations and facilitation. He may say, well, I'm better at grant writing, Dave. I'll, I'll do that and I'll try to get good at it. But if, if that's something that's not his strength, I don't need to pull him up and put him as the main speaker and presenter for every one of the workshops, right? It's like me putting the pitcher as the catcher on the baseball team. It's not going to work. It's not the strength, is it? And so that's a kind of the concept of the icky guy. And I think with, the, the, you know, with that connection to a deeper purpose and fulfillment of meaning, is something we have to kind of keep in mind during all this stuff. Because all this relates back to time management. It all starts with this balance. So again, I'm sometimes out of balance. Here's what we can do. Sometimes you're out of balance. Like right now I'm focusing a lot on this stuff, this stuff, but not that much on this stuff, right? Uh, always have this in the background, but haven't been to church in a couple of months. And I, you know, but I don't get always my things from church, right? I did a hike last weekend for a few miles on a beautiful day, and I had some moments uh, and I thought and I reflected and I meditated on some cool things that were going on in life, and I made that um, um, important to me. And it kind of stayed grounded, and that was my that spiritual. And so, uh, again, in the hot, so here's what's cool. You can do a lot of these things. I listen to audiobooks. <laughs> I've got some new audiobooks that I just downloaded this week uh, while I'm hiking. And thinking about my business startup and some global presentation stuff coming up next year. And I'm, I'm stopping reflecting and valuing God's beautiful world. So, your pattern can do some of these things at the same time. That's what time management's about. I think another good technique we'll talk about in time management is um, you know, how can we make things get done during the things that's not really as relevant. So while you're waiting for your pizza to get done, you're baking a pizza, 
It's at a point of Netflix or quick chat. Maybe you finish a chapter of a book, or maybe you listen to some podcast that's really cool. One of the cool uh, stories that kind of helps, I think, you know, y'all probably seen this before, is how do you kind of put the priorities in place? We know that those six areas of balance are enormous. But how do you know which one of these were the most important for you? And I had this professor in college, and he brought this jar, and I'm like, oh gosh, what is that for? And he says, this is your life. He was like, is it your life? Okay. And he said, this is your life. And what he did is he kind of went through, and he kind of got these other rocks. Now, one of the things that I thought was kind of cool uh, when I was in college, I never traveled much. I, I never, my family was poor, my single mom. And so we was kind of like on the farm, right? And then I started traveling, like going out to uh, parks and stuff. Well, I had a teacher who said, she goes, anytime you travel, get a rock. Get a rock. And I'm like, get a rock? Yeah, get a rock. And then right now where you got that rock and what you were doing on that rock and what year you had that, that experience. And so I started doing that. So in 1995, I started getting rocks from little places. Here's a rock from my first girlfriend that became a wife. 1995, Horse Creek Falls. We were sitting in a waterfall. Beautiful day, cold up in Baylands and Tennessee. And so that was a big moment because that was a girlfriend <laughs> to a wife, and that was our first, my first college girlfriend, and that was a beautiful moment. And so these big rocks represent the most important things in our life, right? So I want you to think about Big rocks are those things, your family, Ellie, your new business startup, your education, that degree that you finally get to, right? Those are your big rocks. You know? and so you put those big things in your life. I went to a cool conference in 2013, big board conference that I spoke at for this convenience store industry, did a little hike to Mount Vesuvius in Italy. It was just, they found this rock and it's a piece of organic. It was a beautiful trip. I had a chance to study with students. All these wonderful little things kind of add up. And this is my life, and I like to look at them and reflect them and touch it's real. It's not a picture, it's not a video, it's not something I put on Facebook. Of course, I use Facebook. I don't use Facebook a lot. I always like to see what's going on in the community with my friends. Uh, maybe post something here and there just to kind of reflect, because I use it as a, as a living journal. So I can go back, I love every day to get what I was doing 10 years ago, because I forget. I mean, I get old, I'm almost 50 in about five years. I get memory lapse sometimes. But these rocks though, and all my friends are like, you're crazy that you want these rocks. I'm like, these rocks represent the important things in my life. And I'll tell stories. And so these rocks are the big things in our life, your health, your family, right? Now, we also have other things. So, we have meetings, our job, our cars, our computers, our free time. And they represent a big chunk of our life, right? They're not as big as the goals, but they're pretty significant. You know, these are the things that kind of we need in our life, but they're not the major goals. They may not be um, the, the most important things, but they're very important aspects of our life. Now, our life's pretty full, right? Would you say this is a full life? You've got your most important things, your goals, your education. Your careers, your jobs, you got money, you got a good house. Is your life full? If you all say this is a full life, right? But you see room for others? We do, don't we? And what we also have is we have little things. We have a lot of meetings and texts and emails, and we have a lot of um, opportunities to waste time. You know, we got TV and we got long phone calls that may not ever go anywhere. And those friends that call us up and really just want to take our time and tell us about their lives. And they also have all these marketing ads and just a lot of other things that fill up our life. Maybe not as number one priority things, but we still have them, don't we? So, here's the thing. Now, do we have a full life? Would you say that our life now is full? Now, if I, you know, the professor, when he did this little time management example, he put some sand in these, and now it's a full life. And the students are like, yeah, it's full. And then he put sand. He said, the sand is a really useless thing in life that we, we just spend a lot of time on. That's not important. But he brought up the, the whole story again. He said, if I put all these little things in my life, you know, all these maybe meetings that aren't useless, 
uh, uh, we have a lot of phone calls, a lot of video games, a lot of social media that we just really aren't, is it adding value to our business, our personal life, whatever. If we put those things in first, do I have room for the rocks? Do I have room for the big stuff? No. So we have to put the big things in our life, and that helps us prioritize. So the big rocks first is basically focusing on the big important tasks gives you plenty of time to let go with the little stuff. Does that make sense? That's what should drive us. That's what should help us manage our time with it. And I thought that was a great example of how we can prioritize our lives to be valuable, right? So big rocks first. So it was a joke for a couple old bosses of mine. Like, big rocks first, height, because I'll be focusing on little details. I might not really think about the big picture. I'd be focusing on the report or the way it's formatted. And I wanted it perfect. And I remember this one time a boss came to me and said, you know, David, he says, you try to do 100% on every project, and you're managing seven or eight projects at a time. You cannot put 100% on every project. It's impossible. And if you do, I want, to, I want you to know I'm not going to keep you around. He said, 80% is fine, because you've got a lot of stuff going on. And you have an 80% solution. It's, in many cases, fine. But we always try to strive for 100%, but we can't be as effective if we try to do perfection in everything. We lose that. Uh, Sometimes I see the tremendous consequences from little things. I'm tempted to think there are no little things, right? So the little things can be the big things, but also we can also get kind of focused on the little things. So I want to kind of switch gears real quick. Uh, we're going to nine. What's our schedule? Eight, that's nine is fine. Okay. Yeah, I want to respect our folks online and everybody in here. So I want to kind of say, what is the biggest challenge of managing our time? Procrastination. Oh. How many people can relate to this one? How many people procrastinate? If you don't raise your hand, you're like, fake your mind. You didn't raise your hand. I mean, <laughs> procrastination is the devil <laughs> in all of them that we deal with. It's the thing, hard work, I love this one though. Hard work often pays off after time, but laziness always pays off now, right? It's so easy to look at some big task, big rock, and say, gosh, that big rock's off the big. It's really too much. Dealing with this business is too much. There's been times when we're sitting with Colin and some other of the guys, we're like, we ain't going to get this thing lost. This is, this is too much, too much stuff on it. And it's easy to kind of just not break things down to smaller increments and procrastinate. So we can't do it. Um, so procrastinate, procrastination is when we put things off that we should be doing. We avoid those high priority things, things that are challenging. But here's the thing. If you redefine what's challenging, it makes it a lot easier. Right? I think that's the thing. And I tell students, I say, when you see your comfort zone, you define what your comfort zone is. Maybe speaking English for someone from the Ukraine is, a, is an impossible challenge. But, you know, as, as we go back and we see that some people, they don't see that as a challenge. They see it as an opportunity. And they procrastinate on these things that they don't see as opportunities. We procrastinate because we don't have, we have doubt. Um, one thing I like about Anthony Robbins is he talks about building confidence. And that was something I had very little. I was an introvert. I was a computer science programmer major. And I did not have the confidence. And it took a lot of mistakes and failures and experience and exposure to new things before I felt confident. And then as you will get in more hands-on mode, your confidence builds. Your confidence builds. You have less doubt. Uh, you don't know where to begin, you're waiting for the right time, you, uh, you don't think things is, are easy, or you think they're too hard. You underestimate it, or you overestimate it. And later, I talked about perfectionism. If you're like, oh, it's got to be perfect every time, then you're going to be too perfect all the time and never get things done. So what can we do? Well, number one, stop. And this is one thing I had this neat class I went to, and the guy gave everybody a rubber band, and he said, try this for a week. He said, every time you get ready to start a task and you don't want to do it and your mind shifts to pulling up an email, doing a Facebook note, flip yourself. And then write down the number of times you flip yourself for that. And that really is true because when you recognize your procrastinating, stop. Break that pattern of behavior and recognize your, your procrastinating. When you go jump on Facebook or when you do Instagram or you go to Snap you get, or Twitter, chicken on TikTok, you do that because that's kind of a, it hits that endorphin level. We're always looking for a dose of endorphins to, you know, satisfy our, our chemical balances in our brains. 
Uh, but when you can say, well, why am I procrastinating? Because it's too hard, don't have the skills, don't have the confidence, need some help, call a friend. Why am I procrastinating? I need to get this done. Or maybe you say, this is an easy task. I can do it in my sleep. Well, then if you can do it in your sleep, then do it. First, find the smallest part of the task that you can do now. Get it, make some make movement. Just start. Uh, identify the emotion associated with doing it. You know, try to turn negative things into positive things. I think that's really important. When you get ready to do something and you think it's going to be really like a big project, say, oh, you know, when this project gets done, here's the outcome. Here's my big rock. It connects to my big rock. And I always like to have these visual things. I think it's important to put your visual goals up. When I was in Brazil, they had their metrics posted in every little cubicle of some of the businesses I visited, showing what's going on with their sales or people relationship stuff. Any of things, visually, you never knew what was going on. And you're 60% you're more likely, if you've got your goals posted, you're 60% more likely to accomplish them because you see them frequently, right? You're being reminded constantly. Finish something that's incomplete, delete stuff, move on. You know, if you touch something once, either do, delete it, move it, re delegate. Let somebody else do it. Uh, here's some time wasted filters. I'm going to go into a lot of these. You know, uh, you know, not delegating correctly, wasted time on phone calls, what, uh, too much time at the water cooler, or social media time, cluttered workspace. You go to a meeting and it just takes 10 minutes to get the meeting started, and then you have 20 minutes of meeting, and then you try to end it, and it just never, never ends. Uh, too much socializing, you know, uh, good eye information. We did a study once in this company I worked for, and we found that um, business workers, knowledge workers, were spending about 20 to 30% of their week trying to find information and, and organize it correctly. Like, oh, where's that PowerPoint? Do you think how you do that? We did it 20,000 times. We, we had one person who did it instead of teaching everybody how to do it. We had to go find that person, and then that person helped us do it. And then we had, so you spend a lot of time wasting time doing things you've done before because you didn't manage how you processed it, filed it, saved it, organized it. And so that's why I love Google. I put all my presentations from 1985 up on Google, and I'm doing a little paper or project or something. I can type in the search, and there's gig and a half or a terabyte and a half of day pack stuff that's got my previous projects. I can find it quickly. I can sort it, organize it, and there it is, versus having 63 little mini hard drives trying to find stuff. So that's a big time waste for bad planning, procrastination, boom, 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 junk mail, visitors. So those are time wasters. And you know, we gotta kind of realize and we're kind of jumping through some of these um, myths because we know how time management has a lot of myths to it. We bounce around these, these little time wasters and that are barriers to us. That's what stops us from getting things done and focusing on big rocks. And I always like to be honest, watch 15 minutes more TV. Oh, I like pressure. My students love to procrastinate. I love to be able to track when they're submitting assignments because I know they submit them about 10 to 20 minutes before class. Even the big ones, like a presentation. Hey, I've got four kids this week submit an assignment like 30 minutes before the class. I'm like, they could have done that and I'm giving them four days. Why are they waiting for the last minute? Oh, I thrive on that little adrenaline rush. It's a really a negative thing. It's an adrenaline rush for procrastination. We all do it though, don't we? So we don't think that you know these are factors, but they sure are. Um, you know, and I love this book called Eat the Frog. So here's if you don't learn anything else today, here's the tip. Besides big rocks, work life balance, eat the frog. It's a book by this, there was a book about time management. He says, when you get to work, when you wake up, do the biggest thing on your plate. He used the examples of frog. Nobody likes to eat a frog, right? Frog legs are good in the, in the South. You like frog legs, they're fried. Um, but you wouldn't eat the whole frog. He said, eat that frog because once you eat that frog, that's the biggest thing on your plate, the biggest area in your big rock's first jar. Get that done. Then the rest of your day, you build off that momentum. Does that make sense? When you get that first big thing done, <coughs> you've had a win for the day. A lot of times we wait to do the big thing in the last part or when we think we need to do it. If you do that early on, you'll, you'll be able to kind of find that right balance. So, um, kind of really quickly, I'm gonna kind of, you know, get you to ask these questions about your, your goals. What is the purpose of the job? What do you measure as success? And this is for folks who are, you know, in the business world. What do you see as exceptional performance? How do you achieve it? You need to ask these questions. Who are those people that you value and you see as leaders? Do you look at 
uh, I was uh, about, I put an order in for this Tesla truck. So I love, I love to see him. Tesla. You know, he's great. And I'm like, you know, that guy's got it going on. He manages a multi billion dollar business from SpaceX to, you know, some of the hyperloop transportation stuff he's doing underground to Tesla cars. And so, you know, that's a good role model. And I think we all have to have role models for people as we look at business world, as we look at some teachers, uh, students who might look at teachers or students that look at other peers. Um, so ask yourself these things, you know, what are these priorities and deadlines? What resources are available? Uh, one thing I've spent a lot of time with a lot of organizations is how to delegate. You can't do everything. The Pareto principle is basically uh, this concept of 80-20. Have you ever heard the 80-20 law? 80-20? 80 percent of your outputs come from 20 percent of your effort. Timothy Ferris talked about this in a book called The Four Hour Work Week, one of my favorite books for entrepreneurs when I was going through this entrepreneur stage. He basically started several businesses and he found out that he was spending 80 percent of his time from his customers that had problems with their orders. He was selling uh, new, uh, like um, healthcare goods, protein powder, creatine supplements. And he had all these orders. And he was, as a manager, he was having to deal with all these problem orders. And that was taking 80% of his time. But they only paid 20% of the revenue from that business. So what he did, he flipped the switch. He flipped the mindset and said, I'm gonna put 80% of my time into the 20% of my best paying customers. And then his business tripled over a two year period. Because instead of wasting time on the little stuff that was tasting, taking a lot of his time, like for me, I, I, I've got a, a virtual assistant. I've had a virtual assistant since 2004. A little person I pay three or four bucks for an hour sometimes if I need them to remind me on big events or if I need them to proofread something. I send it to India uh, or Philippines. I've had different ones. I've had some in Africa and in the UK. I pay three to five dollars an hour and they do stuff that you don't want to do. Marketing. Facebook post, anything in my business, call up people. I had this one guy who was fantastic from the from India. He had a great speaking voice and he would call people saying, hey, I'm so-and-so from Dave Hot Consulting. Uh, we do website development and uh, training e-learning. Would you have a need for that in your business? He called 50 people every two days. I give him 20 bucks and I get one customer from it. Wow, I tried that for about six months. I got too many customers. I had a fifty thousand dollar clock load in just a few months. I just had to quit the business because I couldn't find. I didn't have time for it because I was teaching and doing some other stuff. I just do that as an experiment. I'm like, wow, virtual assistant and outsourcing stuff is pretty pretty cool. I would encourage you guys to do that. Upwork is a place where you can find us. So again, you're seeing you got to put your energy into the most valuable thing. If you're spending time as a small business owner or as a startup or as a student or whatever your career on a lot of small tasks that you think add up to something meaningful, that's okay, do it. But if you're really wasting a lot of time spinning your wheels when you could be putting your talents and skills and energy on the big rocks and then delegating the rest, you're going to find the manage your time for it. If you have family, you know, and you want to kind of spend more time with them, see where you're spending a lot of time, outsource your lawn mower, get a house cleaner. I mean, if you spend six hours a weekend and you really need to do that, see if you can find something else to help with that. But six hours you put toward other things. Uh, I like to prioritize the new list. A lot of people use this approach. It's basically you have a, a, a list in the morning, you put out all the things you know you're going to need to get done. Then you go back a second time and you break them one to ten or one to five or one to three. Some people do one to three. One is I have to get done. Two is, well, I like to get it done, it'll make me progress, and three is not as important, but I'll get it done whenever. It can go on tomorrow's list. So one of the recent time management books I listen to, audio books I listen to, said they do this approach. What they do is they put all the things on the list, and they mark it off when they get it done. And then at the end of the day, they look like, wow, we've got this many things done. If it doesn't get done, it gets moved to tomorrow's next list. And then you get to reevaluate it again. And then the top things come up, the number one things come to the top of the list. And then it just kind of keeps on going down. And then eventually, you're making progress. You see things getting done. So I like that. And we got the priority order. Take action immediately. And again, it helps you focus on the important jobs. And I, I told you this, if can somebody else do the job at least 80% as good as you, we just framed a couple walls and stuff in our, in our excellent areas. I could have done that. I've learned a lot of my table, but then all these black excellent targets. I've enjoyed that. I could probably spend another five or six days and do the framing. We got a guy who could do it for six or seven hundred bucks. It took him four days, and he's experienced. 
And I thought I'd probably do it a day or two. It would have taken me two weeks. I never, it been all my time with, after work, would have been focused on building these stupid walls. He did a great job. He, he was a local, local guy. He wasn't having a, he didn't have a business. He was a, a veteran, a disabled veteran who had done some framing work in the military, and he was doing it on the side, on the side cash. I knew that I could be getting into something bad. I took the risk. He did amazing work. And it saved me an enormous amount of time. It was definitely worth $800. So I could put my time in other things. So think about that. Can I find somebody else who can help? Or just find people who can help you do your work. Build a group of people. This is a great time management tip. Build a group of people that share your values, share your vision. And even if they don't share your vision, pull them in and help them be part of that vision. And maybe they'll share it with you. Get them excited about that. Put your energy into people to put their energy back into you. So I think if you can delegate by people who can help you manage things, this is especially from the bigger businesses out there and the mid-sized businesses, you found the right people, you're going to get a lot more done, right? The things that I look back, they weren't vague high goals. These are all the people who've been part of my coalition and from people that I have a group of people that are mentors, that are business executives and millionaires and professors that I've tapped into constantly. Jim, I mean, it's a network of people that you can bounce ideas off of. I had three meetings last week with a couple of leaders in our region uh, about some projects that I'm research I want to do. And man, they were all over. They, they, they dedicated hours with me and I just wanted 10 minutes of their time. The next thing I know, they're, they're spending a lot of time mentoring me. So put yourself around people who are successful and that you value and pull them into your, your time management uh, Again, get the things off your plate. That's the kind of premise of the, the one minute or the beat that frog. Is get it off your correct plate. Um, you know, this is always a little model on delegation. We won't get as much into that with this session, but I think this is good. Assign tasks, responsibility, and authority to others. If you're a small business owner, trust the people that they're going to go set up a marketing campaign for you. Give them autonomy. Don't micromanage. And what we tend to do in business is we micromanage. And it does two things. It destroys the energy of the person you're micromanaging, and they become dependent upon it. Because with the micromanager, and I, and I coach these micromanagers that are just, um, they're not big picture, big rock thinkers. They're micromanaging these details that aren't adding value to their business because they, it's a control issue, in my opinion. Uh, there's a psychology of this little power thing. But the servant leaders who delegate are there to be a resource. Like if, if I'm your supervisor, I'm here to support you. I'm not the boss. You're the owner of a process, a task, whatever. I'm here to support you. I might own the company, whatever, but I can't be there for everything. And I need to build up trust so that that person does it. So I think when you're delegating, you have to find that the right person, trust that person, establish trust, making sure that the objectives are clear clear the path, the path goal of leadership. But I think it's important when it comes to time management because you can't do it all yourself. You gotta find the talents, find the people who can do it more efficiently, sometimes better. And I think this is hard. And I know Jim and I were probably bad at this. Uh, we're kind of achievement mindset people. Learn to say no. We don't say no very well. The mayor says, Jim, I need to do this. He's not gonna say, oh, I'll think about it. Maybe now because he's got it booted up in, in, in the career where it's just like you can't say no. But when Dr. Allah said no last night at 10 o'clock, 10 05, I said no and said, Yes, sir, I'll be on it. Let's do it. I'll be glad to help on that project. Right? He's our president. He's kind of a boss and boss. I'm like, Yeah. But I should have said no because this is going to be a little pull up my time. But it's a high priority customer. That's the way I look at it. I don't look at it as a boss. I, don't look, you know, I look at my students. I don't look at them as just customers or students. They're bigger picture. They're, I serve them. That's my job as a teacher, just to serve that boss. And so they're priority number one. So when they come in, I always take time. I, I, even if I'm super busy, I might look like I'm super busy, but I'll see if they really need more time, and then I'll refocus. And that's what we have to do with our customers. That's what we have to do our projects, is we have to pivot, refocus, and realize, is that a big rock, or is that some sand? You know, that's the thing. Is that a big rock, or is that sand? Social media, I remember uh, a friend of mine broke up with this girl. She said, so much time on, but I can't want my my spent a lot of girlfriends spent a lot of time on social media. It broke a wedge between them because she was spending so much time on social media, not a lot of time on the relationship when he would ask, let's go out and spend some time together away from technology. And that's a that's a challenge. So be careful with your commitments. Don't say yes to everything. Um, I'm gonna kind of stop it here and um, just kind of make time for questions. I know we're gonna we're probably I've talked a lot again, I've squeezed five or six hours down to 45 minutes. Uh, what kind of 
challenges, questions you have, or anything that I like, like to talk to you about and reflect back on. Anybody have any thoughts, questions? Any tips? Huh? I'm looking. There's no questions online. Nobody online have a question? I put you asleep. This is the pajamas. We had one participate when you asked uh, at the beginning. Um, Sarah said that she, her goal was to make the most of her time while she's at work. She could sidetrack easily. So she did, we did have participation online. Well, I don't know Sarah's still online, but let me tell you an interesting fact. I, I saw a study of research and entrepreneurship, right? And uh, I like to study the gig economy. 60 to 70% of employees in the US are actively doing a side business, whether they're selling, uh, you know, products, they, what is that, some Sensi? I mean, there's these little products, you can sell products or you do a service. Um, they, they may have a cake baking business on the side. 60% of our workplace is, uh, has got a side gig. So it's really easy to uh, lose focus at work. What that tells me is they're not, the managers aren't doing a really good job of giving enough work to the employees or they're not really finding the talents of that employee. So here's what you need to do. If you aren't being challenged at work or you're disengaged, I encourage you to find some balance, talk to your manager, find out where you can re-energize them with your strengths and skills. And if that person doesn't let you do that, then again, find a hobby, a business, a uh, opportunity to learn on the side so you're not getting stagnant. I've been working so many big and small organizations, employees get stagnant, they get lazy, complacent, and they just fit their, their comfort zone gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I had an old guy who, a friend of mine, his name was David, and he was a uh, been in this company for 40 years. And when I said, oh, we're gonna use Dreamweaver and active designs, like the dynamic designs for this new website project with the mobile portal. He's like, no, nope, no, nope. we're using front page. And it was like the old school. We have a question yeah. online. Um, do you recommend an assessment tool for identifying strengths? Oh, yeah, yeah, the strengths finder. So yes, the Gallup strengths finder is what I mentioned earlier. Can it is the best out? tool. Yeah, strengths, your strengths, S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H finder, all one word. Yeah, Gallup strengths finder. Gallup. Yeah, it's the tool that we use, uh, the uh, students, and, but not just students, it's for big, Big companies use them. The company I work for, we gave it to 14,000 employees uh, globally, all over the world, every continent. We had uh, uh, our uh, employees go through this. And basically, we would put people on teams based on their strengths. My number one strength is uh, developer. So when I learned that, when I was going working corporate jobs and starting businesses, and I learned I'm a developer, I started teaching adjunct, and I just got a love of teaching. And it became even more important than career and money and other things because I focused on the strengths. And so that's my biggest tip for those who are in a career now that you may not feel it's the best fit. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have it shared, but um, strengthsfinder.com, uh, gallup.com is a great assessment. I think it's maybe 15 or 20 bucks. If you buy the book, Strengths Finder 2.0, it's, it's fantastic. It gives you top five strengths and a little description about how you're gonna use that in your career, your business startup, your student life. It's the, probably the best assessment that I've ever seen. I've been through a lot of things in my career, and I enjoy, number one, David teaching. He's a good friend, and I enjoy him. I charge my battery. Number two, when you think about your small business, time is money. I mean, there, and, and David's exactly right. A lot of times we get caught in the, the quadrant that it's not urgent, not important. So. You've heard me say before, this is one of my favorite classes because if you can't manage your time, you're going to have trouble in, in a lot of other areas. And it's just like we taught a personal finance for entrepreneur class. And it was a four week class using the Mint platform, which is into its personal finance software. You'll never be a good business owner, a smart business owner, if you can't manage your personal finances. So I think the same thing, one of the key foundations to starting a business and being effective is time management. That's why I said before, David, even before you came, this is my favorite class. We've done classes on understanding financial statements. We've done classes on SBR grants. We've done all kinds of classes, but I think David and this is one of the key foundations that you can apply to your life. So I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to love. I think this is a fun group, fun topic, and I think all of us can make a difference whether it's in our community, our job, our career, globally, internationally, wherever you feel that you fit in and you get that ikigai, your sense of purpose and meaning, you go back to the spiritual 
purposeful career, whatever it is, you know, it might be just so small. It doesn't even have to be significant as starting a business. It could be just as simple as having a good, well-rounded life or family. I think you know, how we put our energy into the areas that are important, you know, big rocks, man, when you get those big rocks, you know, I wake up and I tell all my students, I wake up every day and never have a moment where I'm like, gosh, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? I love what I do every single day. And you can, I think everybody, I mean, I look at the people, I look at the drill models and I learn these tips and tricks and strengths. And I'm like, wow, you know, when you apply and not just try, it's a whole other world. You know, starting a business, you know, people say, well, I don't want to start starting a business. It's risky. Well, if you're risk averse, don't start a business. You know, <laughs> if you want to see what the potential is, go for it. So, anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, they got contact info. And if you have any I'm questions. I'm going to hop up really quick. Um, for those of you all who are in person, you can scan um, the big code, and that's just to take the survey to tell us how we did. Um, so we can keep providing content. You all who are joining us on Zoom do the same thing. If you you can just scan it off your screen. And then we have the little QR code down to the side for next week's office hours, which I'm teaching on Canva 102. And if you miss Canva 101 and you think that's something that could benefit you, it's on our YouTube page available for you. So thank you for everyone who joined in today. Um, we hope to see you again. And thanks to my students who came. I wish when I was in college 100 years ago, 